eh, bienvenido a la Universidad Nacional Autónoma de México. Nos da muchísimo gusto tenerlo con nosotros. Eh, y bueno, es realmente un honor. Así que empezamos en cuanto usted guste. Ok, bueno... How very nice to be with all of you this afternoon, or this evening, I guess. I'm going to spend this time doing several things with you. Yes, we could spend two hours speaking about Beethoven and DBC, but I was sent videos of each of you and thought it might be worthwhile to start out with a few comments about what I saw. Conducting is sometimes called a silent profession. We are supposed to communicate using our hands, mm -hmm. our face, our body, and last, our words. Y por último, nuestras palabras. So with that in mind, Tomando I just want to offer a few comments about the excerpts that I saw. I come from a generation where if Something was good, you never said bueno, anything about it. Rather, the job of the teacher was to let the students know what wasn't right and how you might fix that. Each of you had very good, strong characteristics. But as with every conductor, especially including me, there are always things that we can do better. I'm just going to read what I wrote down in the order of the conductors that I saw. The first one... Primero, was the Von Williams piece, so I don't know if de, that was Carlos or Jose. No sé si fue Carlos that. o Jose, una de Von Williams. Yo hice Bogan Williams. And you are, uh, hold on, you're Carlos, okay. Carlos. So, a nice choice of repertoire, was that your idea? Buena or? selección de repertoire. Fue idea de, de mi maestro. It was my teacher's idea. Good for you. You took something unusual, Excelente did some good things with it. But I have a question for Pero you. Pero te tengo una pregunta. Where was your left hand? ¿Dónde estaba tu mano izquierda? Yeah. So, a lot of things I'm going to say. Muchas de las cosas que each diré. Of one of the most difficult things. Uno de los puntos más difíciles. Of course, there's one thing we all shouldn't do. Por supuesto que hay una cosa que conduct, nadie debe hacer. Right? Que es dirigir en doble. So, when we... Think sí, about our hands, perhaps our right manos, hand is like a steak, or for you vegetarians, perhaps the broccoli, and the left hand is the okay, salt and the pepper. Pepper. We use it very carefully because we don't want to lose the flavor of the main okay. dish. Carlos, although I appreciated you not Carlos, engaging with your left hand, I think that when you don't want to use it, It's not such a good idea just to drop it down by your side. Keep it up somewhere here, and then when you need it, close. The other thing I noticed, and this is true of almost every one of you, you don't breathe. Breathing is the most important force in all of music. When you give an upbeat, assuming it starts on an upbeat, you need to inhale. Why? Okay. Because... Everyone needs to know where Porque your is going to start and where it's going pulso. to land. Most important, each of you Lo has to start. Es que a couple of you, for example, would start at one level, and then they raised their arms, and then they came down below the level where it started. Nivel donde so, think about that. Always es que imagine the line. The beat starts on the line, donde comienza goes up pulso, in one way, su mano Comes sube en un sentido a la misma line. velocidad y aterriza en la misma línea. That's how people know exactly when to play. If you couple that with taking the breath, si esto la coplan, not only will it be clear for the orchestra, no solo le quedará claro you actually la orquesta, don't even have to come down. Sino que quizás, you can go and everybody no knows where you're going to land. Con esto, exactamente the donde exactly the same, aterrizar porque la distancia es la misma. The speed is exactly the y, same. Okay. The next person I saw, I think, was that Jose? Was that Jose? Who did the, uh, uh, what did you do? Hold on. What did you Jose? Was it a uh, Rossini Overture? Barber of Seville? Is that right? Who, who did Barber of Seville? Okay. 
So, um, pues. you also need to work on breathing. And for you, Para ti. You're, you're, you chose a piece that has a Tú lot of character. Right? It begins almost if it's, if it's lighthearted, a little bit of mystery. A, sí, con cierto misterio, and then, un poco when it comes to the allegro, it's a little dramatic. The problem I saw in El your problema patterns que of yo vi en tus was that de pulso, different emotions and thoughts es que con todas estas all the same. So if, uh, if you're going to do... Así pues. Whatever you do, show it in your beat. Sea que hagas, muéstralo con tus pulsos. Muestra el carácter de la música. Deja que entre en tu... Which leads me, actually, Esto me lleva, de hecho... To a little trick, I guess, Un truco, that hacer, all of you might employ. Eh, the next time you watch yourself in video, es que... turn the sound off, turn the volume down to nothing. <laughs> Not the person who's translating. I need your volume up. Um, are, are we still in touch? Because I don't hear a voice anymore. Can you all hear me? Just wave. Have we lost something here? I can see things moving, but I don't hear anything. Hello? Uh -huh. No, my bro, it's, it's every, everything's all right. Okay, okay. We do you, we do you well. Okay, so you turn the sound off. Many, many years ago, when I was first starting conducting, my teacher said, that you should be able to tell what piece someone is conducting just by the physical gesture, not by the sound. I was very busy uh, conducting, I think I was in Estonia at the time in 1976. In those years, the sound from television stations coming from other countries was blocked. So if you lived anywhere in the Soviet Union, you didn't get the sound. But there was a concert on coming from somewhere over in Finland across the sea, no sound. But the conductor was Rafael Kubelik. And in really five seconds, I knew what PC was conducting. And I could actually enjoy the performance because everything he did was showing what was in the music. So I want you all, when you review yours, or any other conductor for that matter, when you watch something, take the sound out, maybe skip ahead, try to figure out where are they in that piece of music. You'll learn a great deal. You'll learn that actually the beating of time is not so important if you're able to convey the sense of the music. So. That having been said, I think the next person I watched was whoever conducted the Corelli. So uh, who, who, who did that? A little hard to tell things because the yeah. camera was so far away. But um, oh, there you are. Hello. For you, I assume you had, what, about uh, 12 people playing, maybe? Maybe less? Yeah? OK. So. It was very clear that you were conducting in that excerpt with eight beats. I was always looking and seeing you were conducting in eight too much. Everybody is playing almost all the time, so they don't need that much information. And you become aware of what the beats are as opposed to what the music is doing. Once in a while, even at a slow tempo, you can you can maybe start an eight and then just let the motion take itself and go to something a bit slower because the musicians, they, they know this music. Everybody's playing at the same time. So there's no reason to be quite so fixated on where the beats are falling. Just show them more in phrases. They'll know if somebody gets in trouble, that's where you use your left hand and you point out, here's a down bar. Downbeat happens here. If something gets off, that's one of the reasons we have the left hand. 
Um, okay, the next one I saw was somebody who did the Madame Butterfly. Who was that? That was me. Okay, hello. Hi. Generally a very nice job, but I had a couple of comments for you. And the first one, when a singer makes an entrance at the beginning, look at the singer, <laughs> right? You know that. Uh, I could have used a little more interaction. So I felt that what you were doing was really in communication, that you were right from the start able to communicate with them in case they decided to do something a little fancy, which always happens with singers, doesn't it? Um, I also thought that you, you could use a little more expressive beat. It was a little too careful. You were, you were very concerned about your technique and sometimes the music itself gets lost. A little bit what I've been saying for the others. Give us a feeling of what the music is saying, more variety in the size of the beats, but generally you had a good control of things. Now you just have to incorporate more into your body and into your face. Next came, oh, now is the Barber of Seville. Ah, uh, but the one with the singer, the Uno uh, Poco Voce Fa. Uh, who did that? Was that Maximiliano? Okay. Ah, okay. So you have the same comments. More breath, more character, and look at the singers. <laughs> um, one thing you need, that breath thing for you is really important, especially when you have things like da-da. You need da-da. So people really know where to place those upbeats. It was not particularly clear. And sometimes when you had to catch the singer on a downbeat, it can be tricky. You have to really be careful about your beat starting someplace and here. So the orchestra knows always where you're going to land and where they're going to place their notes, either as string players or as wind players. Then came the Brahms two. That was Gonzalo, was that right? Be here? Maybe. Well, maybe all of you saw this. Um, uh, Aquí. Are you there? Okay, Aquí. good. See, si. hola. For you, the, the camera angle was a little difficult for me to tell things, but a couple things. One is I didn't see so much contrast in your beat. So your legatos, like da, 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 whatever it was, they looked almost the same as Yum, da, 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 ya, da. You need to really show yum, da, 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 ya, da, so that we can feel where you want that dramatic energy and where you want an open singing line. I did have a question for you though, just because I never heard it this way before. Usually when I do these kind of things, I don't talk about interpretation. My job is to help you get what you want. But I, I honestly don't think I've ever heard da, ya, ba, da, da, ya, da. Was that your idea or did the horns decide to try that? No, fue idea mía. Your idea. Uh, if you're gonna do that, which is quite different, you have to show it, you have to give da, ya, Da, and then connect. Da, da. So it's because I wasn't sure if it was something you wanted since both those bars looked exactly the same. Um, now, maybe you, you don't know that this is unusual in, in the interpretation, but I found it going, whoa. So I went back and looked at the score and went, yes, there's a possible reason that that can be like that. So you were certainly valid in doing it because you understood what the phrasing looked like, but now you have to show it to us as well. Uh, but again, a little more character definition between what's singing and long and what's rhythmically a little more pungent. Then we had, oh, the Holberg suite. Uh, was that uh, Daniel? Daniel? John? Yeah. Okay. All right. A lot of good things. But when you get ready, I liked that you got everybody to pay attention. And then you gave the upbeat and what happened to your head? <laughs> right down on the ground. You looked down. The one time you cannot look down is when you give a downbeat. 
you need to be in communication with your players. That immediately says, okay, you guys can do this all by yourself. I don't care. Even if you're doing it for memory, which I think you were. Um, so uh, think about when you watch this video again, where your head is, who are you communicating to? Again, with relatively small forces, I appreciated that you kept your beats on the smaller side. They always have to be in conjunction with what we are uh, faced with in terms of the number of people we're conducting. But you always have to communicate. You always have to be in touch with the musicians. And then finally, uh, we have, I can't read my writing anymore. Uh, oh, the Signor Bruschino, Bruschino, sorry. Um, uh, there, there are a lot of good things here, but uh, was that Aaron? Aaron? Yeah, was that right I got the right here. person? Oh, there you are. Hello. Yes, yes. Hello. Okay. So I thought you had a lot of good things going on, but we're going to talk once again about conveying the character of the music. There was a place where it's lyric in, in the introduction, long introduction, and you go into two, and then you stayed in two for the more military, or whatever that is. And it looked like it had nothing to do with the kind of music the people were playing. I'm all for conducting in long, broad gestures. I like it when it's not so many beats, but sometimes we need those beats to convey what the underlying motion is in the rhythm. And that troubled me, that I was looking at something from you, but I wasn't hearing the same thing that you were conducting. Even though it's going on in your head and the players are doing okay, there has to be a connection with how the music sounds and how it looks. So that would be my chief uh, criticism. Also, it, it didn't allow you much room to be able to play with your left hand more and indicate the humor of the piece. I liked very much that you left the players to the musicians to play on their own often, but once in a while, I think they needed you a little more often than you showed them. So I know that's tough. Uh, none of you got away unscathed and you shouldn't. When I was a student at Juilliard, my teacher for four years was the distinguished French conductor Jean Marel, who was the teacher of a conductor who sadly died today, James Levine. I don't know if you know that, but he passed away, he was 77. Well, Morel never had a good word for any of us, ever. In my fourth year at Juilliard, I gave a performance of Gershwin's American in Paris. When I came off the stage, I knew that it had gone well. I knew that my teacher couldn't say anything about it that would be overly critical, finally. So I went up to his office he sat at his desk, munching on his little pieces of cigar that he always had hanging out of his mouth. Finally, he looked up and he said, Slutkin, it was not bad. This was the highest compliment I got in four years. So believe me, you guys got off clean and cheap. Take those comments as I intended them to be constructive, things that will help you. Okay, so let's get to the business of why I was asked to be with you and perhaps why I chose these two pieces. Over this past year and during the pandemic, I've done a couple of score study sessions. Uh, some cases they ask me for pieces, usually works of Aaron Copeland. But in this case, I basically had my own way and could pick what I wanted. Because as I mentioned, I try not to talk so much about interpretation. I try to talk about how we learn this music and what we can gather in terms of the technical expertise, both in study habits and actual conducting that we can all learn from. These two pieces will be among those for which you will audition for the first jobs you apply for if you don't already have them and they will be among the first pieces that you ever conduct. They are pieces that when you get to relatively good orchestras, the members of the orchestra will have played far more times than you have ever conducted them. 
So for pieces like this, we need to always be alert. Always assume that we know just a little bit more than everybody else, understanding that in reality, they know more than you do. So let's start with Beethoven. And perhaps the first issue that comes up is, what edition do we use? I changed residence mm, about two years ago. And for 40 years, having been a music director, my entire library of scores was always housed with the orchestras that I led, whether it was in St. Louis, where I've returned just to live, or Washington, or Detroit. Whenever I needed to study something, I would go to the hall, get my scores, bring them home, study them, and then when I finished, whether I was on the road or whatever, the scores would go back to the library. We always knew where they were. Now, I don't have my own orchestra anymore. I don't want an orchestra anymore. I'm quite content to do what I'm doing. That means for the first time since I was very young, I had my own music in my home. I had a little more music than I had room for in the new house. So I had to decide what am I going to get rid of? My father, who was a eminent conductor and violinist, had left me all of his violin music and a few scores. Well, I had no further use for his violin music, so I sent that off to the school where he studied, the Curtis Institute in Philadelphia. I have a lot of songs and jazz charts and all that. I used to do that. Played a lot of jazz piano when I was younger and worked with a lot of singers and other instrumentalists in various degrees of the popular culture, but I knew I wouldn't need that anymore. So I sent that off to my son who lives in Los Angeles and is embarking on a career as a composer for film and television. That seemed appropriate. And then it was time to look at all those scores I had. Did I really need five editions of the Beethoven symphonies? No, no longer. There's always something to learn, of course, but in all of your time and mine when I was around your age, that studying process had changed. Now I was building primarily off of my experiences as a conductor. What did I learn? What sort of Slatkin edition emerged from all of these? So I don't really think anymore about which edition to use. I just go with what I've accumulated for more than 55, almost 60 years of conducting now. So the edition I work from, which has this lovely old binding, so you can see it's pretty old. Um, it's, uh, I don't even know who does this, which one, uh, Breitkopf. It's an old Breitkopf edition. Did I used to look at the facsimiles of the manuscripts? Yes. Did I look at the sketches that Beethoven got rid of? Yes. Did I see the recent research? that uh, people like uh, Del Mar have done and others, yes. Uh, is it interesting? Most of the time. But that same teacher who said to me it wasn't bad also said that the musicologists are all for theology, but sometimes they forget about the music. I'm sure many of you will encounter moments when you're looking at one of these so-called critical editions, when you go, well, Maybe that's what the composer wrote, but it doesn't make any sense. You know something? The composer is not always right. The publishers are not always right. There are very few pieces within the standard repertoire where you can't find something that doesn't make sense to you. What do we do about that? We ask ourselves one question, which we must answer in order to change anything from what we see in the print. And that question is, why? 
If you go to a performance and somebody does something and you go, that's incredible. What a great idea, this retard there. Or, wow, maybe they did something with the orchestration here. Or maybe there was an incredible crescendo. How did they do that? You need to be answerable or you need to answer that question. Not just how did they do it, why did they do it? And saying because they felt it that way, that's not an answer, that's an excuse. Every decision you make as a conductor, as a musician, must be able to be answered to that question, why? So that's why the addition becomes important. When I was your age, and a couple of weeks ago, I led a performance here in St. Louis of the Stravinsky Octet. Uh, these days, it's a familiar enough piece and doesn't really need a conductor, but with social distancing and all the wind players 10 feet away from each other, they needed somebody to keep it together and maybe give them some ideas. I actually conducted from the very score I used the first time I conducted it when I was a student at school. So that score has been around for a long time. And boy, is it marked up. There are things in blue. There are things in red. There are things in regular pencil. There's an inscription from somebody commenting on the octet. There's indications where the revised 1952 version is different than the original. Man, I can't believe I was that way. But that was the right way to be. Nowadays, People are surprised when they look at scores I use because there's really not much marked in it at all. And the reason they're twofold. One, experience, knowledge of the repertoire itself, of course. And I've gotten to the point where when I do a piece of music, I want to be able to react to what I'm hearing and seeing in the score. One time I was visiting Chicago uh, with Maestro Schulte. He and I had become friends. And he began a concert with the Meisterzinger Overture Prelude. And there was the music. He turned the pages every so often. And we went out to dinner afterwards and I said, Maestro, I'm curious, you have to have conducted this piece, what, 250, 300 times. Why do you still use the music? And boy, did he have a good answer. He said, because my dear, you will never know when you discover something else. Right. Always there so he would learn. So I keep the scores unmarked now because if I have a marked one in front of me, I'm gonna to react to something I might have thought about or done earlier in the previous life. Now I want the music to jump out at me fresh with all the experience I've had, both good and bad. So let's dive into Mr. Beethoven's symphony. As I said, this is a piece you are going to deal with all your lives. Apparently, according to this score, I first dealt with it in 19, what? 74 in Grant Park in Chicago. I, I, I used to keep a list of where I did things and then I stopped doing it, which is too bad. I'd kind of like to go through it. I might do that for my next book. So I need to have a little bit of feedback here because asking questions tells me a lot about all of you. Yeah, from each of you. Tell me, when you open the score, what is the first thing you look at? Just go in any order, I don't care. Okay, what's the first thing that you, you, you are interested in? Seeing, somebody? Instrumentation and the name of the, of the piece. Good, okay, anybody else? The character. Yes. Anything else? We've got that about... La indicación agógica. Yes, that comes a little bit later, but still, it's, it's, it's good. Here's what I do. Let's assume that none of us have ever seen this piece. Yeah, yeah. Let's assume that none of us has ever seen this before. I think that first thing is the instrumentation. Why? because possibly 
we're considering it for a performance and we need to know if we have all the uh, players we need in order to be able to perform this piece. And the problem here, at least in my score, sorry, somebody has sent me something to mark the movement of this. Ah, hands higher, I can move this down, thank you. Okay. Um, the problem is in this edition of the score I have, it only lists when you open the page that this is the title page. So you get to find out what it is and we get to see a few other things. The other symphonies, <laughs> it's nice. It's part of volume one of Beethoven's works, that's good. And then you turn the page and this is what we see on the first page, okay? There is no listing of the instrumentation other than those instruments who play in the first movement. So it's possible, not with all of you, but that somebody will pick this up and go, oh, I can do that. I have flutes, oboes, clarinets, bassoons, two horns, trumpets, timpani, and, and strings. I can do that with 25 people, that'll be fine. Of course, when we get to the last one, we discover there are other instruments. There are three trombones, there's a piccolo, there's a contrabassoon, things change. So we have to look through to find that out. Sometimes the instrumentation is not listed separately. So you need to know that. The next thing I do when I have a score that I haven't seen before is I start just turning pages. I look at it to get a feeling as one person said, the general character. And if we were coming to this symphony, I'm not looking for details now, I'm just looking what kind of mood is going on. And I see a lot of energy happening here. Um, I see that it's a relatively quick tempo, of course, um, but the operative word is energy. That's what leaps off the page when I look at this first movement. And then I look at the second movement and I see that indication andante, con moto. I look for those tempo markings right away. I don't look for the metronome marks. I look for what the composer has told us about the expressive feature of the music. And so here I see something that looks a little unsettled. The rhythm is a little strange in the viola and the cello. And then I see there's gathering momentum in the speed of the notes. We've gone from these kind of lazy notes at the beginning to triplets on the second page and then 32nd notes a little bit later. So the momentum each, each is building. I also see as we go along that it's basically a couple of variations. That's easy to determine just as you're looking through forward. So you're getting the idea of the structure. First one, more or less traditional uh, sonata allegro form, second movement, theme and variations with a rather lengthy coda. Then we come to the very bizarre thing. Again, if you're looking at it for the first time, you're gonna see something near the end where it says più moto. Very unusual for Beethoven or anybody prior to Beethoven changing a tempo in the middle or the end of a movement, very rare. So I know I'm gonna to have to come back and try to understand why he does this. Although I see that about 16 measures later, he's got tempo primo again. So this is, just, I already know this is something I have to pay attention to. Then we come to the third movement. We know that Beethoven symphonies tend to have either a minuet or a scherzo. This one marked as an allegro would appear to be a scherzo, mostly because it's got a retard in the seventh bar and a fermata. So a minuet implies there's a dance-like character. This doesn't look like a dance at all in any way. This looks like something different. So I'm gonna to have to pay attention to that too. Uh, we go on and we see that surprisingly, the first double bar, first double bar does not have a repeat, which is what we would normally expect in a movement like this, right? 
A typical scherzo and or minuet is playing the phrase once, repeating it, playing the next set of phrases once, and then repeating that, and then going to the trio. This is not like that at all. This is a completely written out rendering of the first part of the scherzo. So I have to think about that. No recapitulation of the material on the first go round. However, there is, of course, the uh, first repeat in the trio section, but there's no indication that the tempo will change in the trio. And for a change, the trio, which is usually a kind of relief of the material in the scherzo, this trio looks aggressive, very different. So I have to think about that. Then I see we have a first and second ending. And rather than a straight out repeat of the second thing, second part, Beethoven has written it out, except this time the cello and bass do a diminuendo and the material repeats, but in a different way. It's a different sound, but it's already written out instead of having to put a repeat in. And then we see our recapitulation of the opening material, but again, very unusual for the time. It's not presented in the same way, even though the music is the same. The cello and bass get their tune and the bassoon gets it, but it's more almost sarcastic because there's pizzicato going on here and then there are grace notes in the violins. So I'm gonna really have to pay attention to this movement because something is definitely different. This may in some ways be the most radical movement of this symphony, just because it is so different than what has been written before. And then when we come to the end of the movement, we notice what is essentially a coda that leads into the last one, but an unusual one with a kind of static sound going in the strings, just holding long notes, the timpani doing a pulse, the uh, first violins gradually moving ahead with that timpani pulse being reiterated in the cello and bass. And then a crescendo taking us finally to that last movement where we add all those instruments, right? There's your trombones, the piccolo, they're all there. So now we know. So I have to start thinking about, okay, what's different? Well, it looks pretty military the way the trombones, the trumpet, and the timpani are indicated. The fact that the contrabassoon and the piccolo are in there, it's, it's a very different kind of sound. Certainly new for Beethoven. He hasn't used these instruments before. Something quite different. But I also notice that in the second bar, there's a repeat. Very strange for a last movement, right? There's a repeat. Hello, Beethoven has that in some of his early symphonies, but this is unusual for this. So I'm looking, going, it's pretty heavy looking. Uh, for C major, it should be celebratory, but this looks a little bit over the top in terms of the kind of sound he's looking for. I worry about balances just in looking at it. So many long notes in the brass that could cover up string motion that's going on. Depending on whether or not you're looking for clarity in the work or whether you're looking for just the overall sweep. These are things you start to look at when you see this piece for the first time. And you notice that this exposition section, shall we call it, is quite long and takes us to a first ending, which then takes us back to repeat. Now I have to think, hmm, why is he doing this as a repeat? Is there really a reason that he wants this material played over again? That reminds me of something that Johannes Brahms wrote to Antonin Dvorak. You may not know that Dvorak was also a very fine conductor and on one occasion, Dvorak was performing Brahms' Second Symphony. Dvorak wrote to Brahms asking him whether he should take the repeat in the first movement. And Brahms writes back to Dvorak saying, at this point, my symphony has been heard many times and the listeners know the material which is going to be developed. When I first read that, and it's in a book by Alfred Brendel, I was stunned. This was the first time I'd ever thought about the repeat as a function 
for the audience. All of us have thought about first movements anyway, sonata allegro form. You repeat the material because you have to repeat the material. It's part of the formal structure. But in reality, it had become something else. Now it was simply to inform the audience about the music so that when the development section came, the audience was sophisticated enough to know about all these themes that were gonna be tossed about. Was this gonna be a similar case here? Did we need to hear this material a second time in the last movement of a symphony? And then if I turn the page and go on from this first and second ending, what do I see? Something that looks similar to a development as we would normally see in a first movement. So maybe this last movement is also sonata allegro form. We shall see as we move along. And indeed that moving along shows us that we have a very strange moment right in the middle of the symphony in the last movement where the tempo changes and Beethoven references the first movement and the scherzo, where it goes to three, four. This was certainly something unusual. Haydn did some things on bridge. Is it a passage meant to get us back to some point in your head, saying, when I come back and study this piece a little more thoroughly, I'll see what that is. Now we get to the presto at the end, lots of notes. He comes to a lovely, if not for some people, overstated conclusion. Uh, certainly by the time the work is over, we are all very comfortable with the key of C major. We know C major, everybody does. So that's kind of the things that occur to me when I open the score for the first time. After that, it becomes a matter of what am I looking for? And I've given you that kind of overview because I'm going to assume that each of you, if you haven't studied the work outright, certainly are familiar with the fifth Beethoven. And you're familiar, perhaps, with the problems that this score presents. They never end. This piece does not get easier, ever. And it starts with something you can have some fun with the first time you conduct it or the next time you conduct it. After you've played through it and you're having maybe a little bit of relaxed moment with the orchestra, just look at the string section and say, strings, I would like you to answer a question for me. In this symphony, at the very beginning, what instruments play? You will be amazed how many people have no idea that there are two clarinets playing along with the strings. You'll hear people saying, oh, the horns play. No. Trumpets? No. Timp? No. Just strings? No. <laughs> so we look at this, and before we even think about our tempo or how we're going to beat it is, why are there two clarinets here? Remember what I said earlier, that big important question, why? If you want to really find out, then the best way to do it is to say, let's do it with maybe three stands of firsts and two stands of seconds, something close to what Beethoven might have had. And let's see if we can actually hear the clarinets. And you can. Then you play it with the full orchestra. And you say, could we do it once without the clarinets and one with? See if you can figure out why Beethoven wanted that sound. Clarinets were probably a bit more aggressive back then. Uh, and I know that the times I've actually wanted to hear it without the clarinets, I've missed that sound. I can't tell you exactly how, but there's something that always gets through. So the clarinets are important. Certainly he could have put the oboes on it if he really wanted that wind color, but he didn't. He didn't do that. So we have to ask ourselves why. And now we come to the problem that has faced every conductor and every interpreter. How do we start this piece? A lot of it depends on how you think the first five bars go in terms of the structure. So the question that you have to ask yourself first is, pa 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 pa, is the strong beat in the first bar 
or is it on the second bar? In other words, does that first bar really serve as a gigantic pickup to the second bar? That's the first thing to think about. Or is it the other way around? Is the strength in that first bar? Or is it just both bars? In other words, is there a phrase structure here? This has troubled conductors ever since the history of conducting in this piece. Everybody eventually comes to their own particular solution. And part of it is solved perhaps by understanding what that fifth bar is, the bar where there's a fermata, preceded by a bar where there's a half note. What do we learn from this? Well, clearly Beethoven wanted that second iteration of the tune to last longer. How much longer? Could be that one bar where there's no fermata, but longer nonetheless. That throws off our whole structure of the phrase, doesn't it? Some people have suggested that maybe it's a question of being a phrase in four, so that the first bar is an upbeat. Four, 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 one, two, ba, 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 three, four, to cover the fermata. And then you're stuck in the next bar because you've given four, and now you're gonna have to give what? Four again, four, ta, 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 ta. So that doesn't feel right. Well, what would happen if we just did it feeling that Beethoven is only adding that extra measure because he wanted to indicate that this was to be held longer? That's one thing, we put that aside for the moment. During my lifetime, I've seen interpretations of this change really dramatically. In my early days, listening to recordings of so many conductors, there was always a pause after the second bar and certainly after the third bar. So I usually, and I grew up hearing, da 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 da, ba 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 ba, da 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 da, which always felt perfectly logical to me, having a little breath. Today, we hear people who take no breath at all other than the eighth rest, like this. And it gives it a kind of anxiety, doesn't it? No matter what you're doing. But maybe it's too breathless. Maybe it's too much to take in. My solution these days, and please, you do not have to do this. I'm just telling you, that answer to the question, why? I think it's perfectly legitimate to think that any entrance that's forte can be sudden. But if you're coming from forte down to piano, you need to have some space in order for the sound to disappear. Say you're playing in a hall that has reverberant properties, Carnegie Hall, Boston, whatever it is. If you end the fifth bar and go right into the sixth bar without a break, you're in danger of losing the first one, if not two notes of what the second violins are doing. So what I do now, almost regardless of where I'm performing it is, I take a breath after the loud note and I tell the orchestra, I don't say anything when I first go through it. I try to see if I can get it just by my gestures. If I can't, then I have to say something. But in effect, every time there is a loud note of the four note motive, pa 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 pa, there's always just an immediate beat to start that off. And when it's a soft note coming off a loud one, I take a breath to allow the sound and the possible harmony clear just a little bit. Here's something that all of you have to think about as well. And it does affect how you study, even though it will not seem like it at first. Max Rudolph in his wonderful grammar of conducting talks about the first time you step on the podium with an orchestra to make sure you know where everybody is. And it used to be just figuring out, okay, who's the first horn? Who's the first trumpet? things like that. These days, you need to see if the second violins are sitting 
to your left or to your right. There are many orchestras now who prefer to go back to a seating that we saw certainly in the 19th century and a great deal of the 20th where the first and second violins were split left, right. There's a lot of controversy about this in some circles. And I think the reason the controversy exists is exactly the reason there's a problem. It's not because of wanting to separate the first and seconds because of the sound they make being similar. No, it goes back to the seating that was employed in opera houses. Think about it. Where direction does sound go? Sound goes up. If you're playing the first violin part and you're sitting on the left and you're in an opera pit, where is your sound going? It's going up, but it's also going into the wall of the opera pit, correct? If the second violins are sitting on the right in the opera house, their sound is actually going up more towards the stage and into the space that's under the stage as well. So in some ways, the seconds have a little bit of an advantage in getting their sound across. But that's the reason the first and seconds were split because putting the second violins under the overhang of the pit completely took out their sound. And that's why we have this today. It makes sense in some pieces. Look, next time you look at a Mahler symphony, think about the second violins on the right outside and you'll see wonderful instances where it's very clear Mahler was writing for that kind of sound. Each have tremolos, but the seconds make a crescendo and the first don't. Doesn't make any sense that they're sitting together. You would never notice it. But when they're seated apart, it makes all the difference in the world. Or the ending of the Ninth Symphony. Just look at it from the point of view where you think about the piece. And whether you do it with the violins together or apart can change your thinking about second violins or in the more traditional view that we have now of being to your left on the inside. And let's also assume for the moment that the violas are to your right, but slightly uh, this direction, and that the cellos are all the way to the right and the basses are along the wall at the back. One other plus of the second violin sitting on the outside on the right actually did have to do with the cellos and basses. The seating for orchestras was first violin, cello, viola, second violin, and the basses were on the left as you look at them. Why is that an advantage? The F holes of the bass and the cello face out. So next to the first violins and the uh, basses are against the wall. The F holes face more out towards the audience. I wound up come to some sort of conclusion about how we want those first five bars to go. Um, I don't know how many of you are string players, but you do have to take in the bowing into consideration. It's well and good to think down, 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 up, down, 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 up. And then the second valves are gonna get really stuck to get to the sixth bar. You wanna be careful about that especially if you're deciding to go right from the end of the fifth bar into the sixth bar without much of a pause. My own preferred bowing is up, 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 down, up, 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 down. And then I change to an up on the fermata somewhere. I ask everybody not to change in the same place so that we don't have a feeling of a beat going on. Uh, if you're not a string player, I'm gonna make two suggestions. Get to know one really well, have them walk you through how these pieces go, what the bowings are, but I also advise you, it, you don't have to do it very well, but it's helpful to learn a string instrument, even for a few months. You don't have to play like Josh Bell <laughs> at all. You don't have to play like Yo-Yo, it, it doesn't make any difference. Learn enough to understand the mechanics. How does fingering work? How do the bows work? How does the sound get produced? Uh, because 80% of what you're gonna to say to an orchestra is gonna to be to the string section. So anything you can do that will help, they will appreciate. So get to know a little bit about the strings themselves. Also, it's always good to learn the alto clef and the viola and the tenor clef and the cello, just to have those. By the way, if any of you have difficulties with score reading, get out your Bach Remenschneider. That sort of sounds 
not so nice, but it's a set of chorales of Bach, usually presented in the different uh, clefs. Sit down at the piano, you've again, you just learn enough piano. I say to conductors, learn enough piano to be able to accompany a soloist from a piano part, not the score. Uh, I'm, uh, when I was a student, we had to learn how to play the scores at the piano. And I think that's good as an exercise, but the last thing you want is to get the sound of the piano in your head. This is like a screen director for a film. You look at this and the sounds come into your head, just as the images of the screenplay come into it for a director. We have to be able to hear this music in our heads just by looking at it. So get to the point where you don't rely on the piano to teach you the music, otherwise the sound won't be the right one. Okay, so we've established our tempo ba, 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 for the moment. It can be slower, it can be faster. Uh oh, what did I see here? Allegro con brio, half note equals 108. And now we get into the other controversy. We haven't even gotten off the first five bars. Yuck. What's that controversy? The metronome. Mm. Well, this has been going on for a long time. What do we know about the Beethoven metronome and the metronome in Beethoven's time? We know that it was invented by Johann Melzel and it was around by the time Beethoven got to his Eighth Symphony. In fact, the second movement of the Eighth Symphony is all about the metronome. So how come we have metronome marks in these early symphonies? Beethoven didn't have a metronome back then. Well, he put them in, in retrospect. He thought, that's a great idea. I'm gonna put the metronome so people will know how fast or slow I want it. We don't know how accurate Beethoven's metronomes are. We have no idea. We do know that as a string player, when you played in the style, you held the bow in a slightly different position than we hold it now. Now we hold it more or less over the frog. Back then they held it a little closer to the middle. In other words, they didn't use all of the bow. So they could play certain passages faster, particularly in that eighth symphony in the last movement. It's really hard to get to that metronome mark that Beethoven puts in playing the way we play now. It's, it's almost impossible for the clarity. So here's 108. I do not recommend going on to the podium with a metronome in your hand, electronic or otherwise. What I can tell you, you can do is think about certain tempi that you know go a certain way. For example, 120. 120 is always bam bam ba dum bam ba 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 or any march. Ya da dum ba da dum ba 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 ya da dum. Marches are 120. Or you can decide for yourself what tempo you think a march goes at, and you will know that metronome mark. Yam pam 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 pa da dum pam tri dum pa dum pa sempre libra traviata. For me, 84. Every singer sings it at 84. Seventy-two. So I know three metronome marks. Actually, I know more, don't I? Because if I know one hundred and twenty, I know sixty. And I can subdivide those different metronome marks and others based on pieces that I know, and they tell me what the metronomes are. And yes, once in a while, I'll think of those other pieces before I delve into the one I'm actually dealing with, just because it's a little bit of a tool that helps me and I don't need a mechanical device out there. It's kind of like perfect pitch, sort of. So maybe we need to rethink the purpose of the metronome. Where it's really valuable is showing the relationship of one tempo to another. So we can see if we move to the second movement that Beethoven's mark here is that the eighth note equals, not, is it 92? The glasses again, it is 92. Or is it 82? No, it's gotta be 92, it is. So 92, that means it's not that radically slower than the opening movement, no matter what tempo we pick. Let's go, da, 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 da. say that's, that's about 108, about. Uh, uh. So we know the second one's not gonna be da ya da, da 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 da, it can't be that. It has to be slower to some degree. 
And then we can look back and or look forward and see that the scherzo, the third movement, starts at 96, almost the same tempo for the beat as the slow movement. Interesting. And then we go to that strange place we looked at where the tempo changes. Uh, no, sorry, it's the last one. Sorry. We look at the last movement and we see, what is it, 104 or something like that? No, 84. 84 for the last one, half note. Slower than the first movement for the beat. Slower than the second movement for the beat. Even though the feeling of that movement is triumphant, we almost feel because of the 16th notes that are going on that it's faster, but it's not. And then we look at that tempo change to 3-4. Can find it. Where are you? Three, four. Come on. I know you're here. I can. I can sense your presence. There it is. Ninety-six. And is ninety-six indeed the tempo of the scherzo? The answer is yes. So Beethoven is clearly telling us he's referencing the scherzo, even though the materials. Yep, bop, 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 ya, ta, 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 that four-note motive from the first movement is played in the tempo of the scherzo. That's important. Another key in that scherzo, but we'll get to that in a second, is that all of a sudden, the ictus is on the first beat. But it feels like an upbeat again. Three, four, one, two, three. That's gonna be important for a passage we'll look at later. I guess what I'm trying to say is that you can determine for yourself what tempo you think are appropriate for your ensemble, for the hall you're playing at, and for yourself. Samuel Barber was notorious at one point for not putting in metronome markings. And then his publisher, Shermers, told him he needed to. He had to put them in. He said, no, when I write con Dante con moto, that's enough. That's all I want the players to know. The publisher insisted. And so when we have Barber works that have metronome marks in them, they're only because the publisher insisted. They are simply guidelines. Always go by your gut and what the tempo indication tells you, not the metronome mark. You'll get locked into something that could be really, really difficult. But we're getting behind, so I wanna move forward. When you look at the sixth bar of this and you see that tossing about ta 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 ya ta 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 ya ta 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 kind of reminds us that Beethoven probably composed this at the piano. And at the piano, all those notes would sound equal, wouldn't they? And yet he's dispersed them among three different instrumental groups. If we go to our setup with the second violins to our left, then the violas middle to the right, and then the first violins on the extreme left, probably the first because they're higher, are gonna be heard more, but we wanna have them balanced. So by the time we get to the ninth bar, the half note, we have a full chord that's emerged we have a C minor chord. So it has to feel very well balanced. This you can't tell as a conductor on stage. Hopefully you'll have an assistant or somebody out there listening to you who can tell you if it sounds correct or not. The conductor really can't hear the same way the audience does. And we are playing for an audience. We do not have the best seat in the house on the podium. Far from it. We hear the people that are in our immediate circle and the winds who are blaring at us in percussion because they're coming off the wall. We don't hear the totality of the string section. It's impossible. We can see them, but hearing them, very, very difficult. So you want to think about studying this in terms of the kind of balance you want. We come to this ya ta 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 yam ya. Now, I can tell you, whenever you conduct this for the first time or with an orchestra that maybe doesn't play it very often, you get to that first violin part with that G major chord. Somebody in the first violin section and maybe the seconds are gonna hold on to two notes instead of one. For some reason, they don't realize it's just that G natural that's held. Somebody always does it. Uh, and it's very interesting, but <laughs> it's not right. Uh, uh, here's a nifty bowing for you. Ta, 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 down, 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 and then up again. Because it's loud, you can have the choice of da, pa, 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 or da, off. Ya, ta, ta, ta. 
off. Get that, that down. Let that sound clear. Otherwise, you're not going to hear the first few notes. Um, I can tell you from experience, this is turning more into me just showing you tricks, if you don't mind, rather than studying. Um, when you get to, do you, do you guys all have measure numbers of some kind? You probably do, right? Yeah, all right. 27, 28. Uh, when, when you get to 28, you actually run into a little bit of a technical problem because of the string instruments. Um, the first violin is da, ya, pa, 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 pa. You see that F down to the E flat? Frequently, the E flat gets lost. And we know it's not da, pa, 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 pa. You can't take a breath before it because it clears the phrase da, ya, pa, 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 pa. You have to complete that. So we tie the F to the E flat and ask the section each time that kind of thing happens to make sure they don't short change that note. It has to be a full eighth, otherwise you don't hear it. And da 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 ya pa 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 da pa 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 pa. Keep the intensity, keep the crescendo so that note is always heard. Um, uh, what I have is measure 41, two, three, four, where the winds are all sustaining a note forte and only the first violins have what we would call the tune, da, 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 right? So block marking, one of the problems of Beethoven, of course, if you have your horns playing forte and all the woodwinds playing forte and only one line of the strings playing forte, it's hard for that to get through. So we sometimes just hit that forte and drop down a tiny bit, just a little bit right away so that we have enough left for the first to be able to get through all that. You want to look at that in every aspect of Beethoven. Where can I adjust the balances so that the lines are clear? Is that going against what Beethoven wrote? No, I don't think so, because more important is the spirit of what the music says, not what the actual print is. This was the way it was written at the time. Everybody played forte at the same time. Everybody played piano at the same time. There was no thinking about trying to balance it by having a different dynamic for different sections. That really doesn't come into play much until the 20th century. You'll see the same problem in Brahms, Dvorak, Schubert, Mahler, whatever it is. Okay. You also wanna pay attention to a place like measure 52, and there's one before, but there is a difference between single forte and fortissimo. You wanna mark those until you really get to know them to the point where it's as clear as possible. Um, just looking for some notes here. So those gradations of dynamics, there, there's a meant to be a difference. The fortissimos are the high point. So make sure you don't have too many of them. That single forte is a little bit less. You also have to determine when notes are going to be long and short. So this place at 60, ya ta 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 ya ta 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 ya. Is that a short note or a long note? There's no dot on it. But then again, if we look, there hasn't been a dot on anything and none of us would ever dare play at the beginning. Da, 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 da. We wouldn't do it. We'd all play it short and aggressive. And these notes can be either long or short. You have to decide which way do you want it and why. For me, I rather like the long note. Yeah, why do I like it long? Because it's setting up the second theme. It's taking us to a new character. Da, 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 ya, da, da. That's a new character. Even though underneath that is little hiding, ba, 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 all those little four note motives. We come to the second theme. Here's an interesting thing to think about. Where does the phrase go? Is it da, 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 ya, da, 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 or is it da, 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 ya, da, ya. Where does it go? You have to think about that. That's another why question. I'm not giving you answers for a lot of this because that's the joy of discovery. Uh, measure uh, uh, 93. This is tricky and I don't like to criticize what other people have done. So I'll just tell you what I do. M many people take some time. Da, 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 yum, pa, and they take a little break and they slow down. I don't like it. I, I like da, 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 To me, that's one line. It, da, 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 resolution. Then a breath. Ba, pa, 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 da, 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 da
Another place you have to adjust dynamics is 105, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, where the winds have that descending. You might have to bring your strings down a little bit to get those first couple bars in. I don't know any conductor who doesn't observe this first repeat. It's so short, you might as well, no matter what Brahms wrote to Dvorak. Uh, your development, everything now is pretty much the same. Uh, the problems are the same. The technical hazards are the same. Your beat has to be consistent. Whatever tempo you choose can be slower or faster. Decide about your long and short notes. Um, and then we get to this interesting place about 180 or so. Da, 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 pa, pa. You get there and you see that uh, you're um, ba, 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 soon, clarinet, oboes, and the flutes. And it's hard to get those through. So again, the strings have to drop down. Otherwise, you're not going to hear it. I did want to point out one interesting phrasing that was shown to me once, and I wound up adopting it. This is uh, 191, 2, 3, 4, 5, I think. Da, 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 ba, ba, ba. All my life, I was used to hearing. Da, 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 ba, 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 ba. And then Somebody said, yes, but the resolution is actually on the last note, not on the first one. And I started doing that and making these longer notes as opposed to punctuated ones. It's just a different way of thinking of the phrasing. And it becomes fascinating as the phrases diminish from uh, four bar phrases down to two bars, then the one trade-offs. Uh, think about it, think about the phrase structure. Now we come to our recapitulation, the oboe solo. Uh, we'll get into this with the WC, which I hope to start at some point. Uh, let the oboe play on their own. If there's really something you don't like, go speak to the oboist separately. Uh, you might be interested in Gustav Mahler's reorchestration. Now I don't say reorchestration, he called them retouchings. Um, he actually started this with four oboes holding the G. And then they all started playing the da, 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 and gradually it reduced down to one near the end. Absolutely fascinating. It was a whole different ethic of how we treated this music at the turn of the 20th century. Nowadays, how dare we stray from what was written when this was actually quite commonplace. So this is a pretty straightforward uh, recapitulation other than sometimes in the past measure 302 I guess where the bassoons have ba, 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 bam, bam, ba. so the first time we know the horns play it right ba, 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 bam, ba. why don't they play it here because we don't have horns that can quite hit those notes so we put it in the bassoons some conductors quite frequently have actually put this in the horns because we have the valves and we can do it so, think about it so everything is the same until we get to this remarkable coda, of course, which is at measure 374. And this is one of two places I'm going to give you a little, oh, little secret. One of the games we played as students was to count how many times pa 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 appeared in this movement. And inevitably, two places got left out. And this was one of them right at 374, because we heard four notes, ya ta 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 ta. But what some of us now do with this in the trumpet is we don't emphasize the first note quite as much, pa 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 pa. So it's still a four note motive there. So you want to bring that out a little bit. Um, another thing I can tell you a little bit about, which is sort of interesting, is around 400 and two, three, four, five, six, seven. Um, again, we, we don't see dots really from Beethoven so much in this movement. We, we would think more. And then when we do see them, they don't necessarily mean off the string, but it's kind of nice in this place, uh, 407, that the first play off the string and the violas and cellos play on. So the first going, ya ta 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 and the other is there, ba 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 ba. So you get this incredible conflict between the instruments. Okay, now the other hidden motive. Uh, hopefully you have the same numbers as I do, but you'll, you'll catch on. 475, 43, 473. Look at the first horn. Think of the tempo, one, one, one. What is the horn doing? Ba, 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 ba. 
the diminution of that four note motive. I have fun bringing it out. And it's amazing when you do it with an orchestra that, where nobody's done that before. They go, oh, I didn't know that. You score a point on that one. Another thing many of us have done in the past, 476, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, the last fermata. Some of us on this hold it a little bit longer and then wait as if it was a grand pause before we start up the coda. Don't have to do it, but it, it makes a quite a nice dramatic effect. And especially since the return is pianissimo, giving it a little more silence and mystery, finally interrupted by those last three chords. One thing I hope you listen to, I think it must be somewhere on YouTube, Leonard Bernstein once uh, orchestrated the Beethoven sketches for this moment and imagined what it would be like. What, why did Beethoven reject certain things? It's really fascinating. So take a listen to that. Okay, I'm going to race through the next ones. I want to get to DVC for you. Any slow movement is reliant from this period on understanding what the quickest note pattern is in the movement. So it's easy to look at this and go, da, ya, da, 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 ya, da. we can do that. It's not very andante con moto. Or we can go, da, ya, da, ba, ya, da, da, da. we could do that if we wanted to. But what is our fastest note pattern? It's the 30 seconds that appear in measure 60 and then again at 199. You think of the right tempo for these notes. And that will dictate what speed you start at. Usually it's gonna be a little quicker than you expected. But we know in this piece, we need to be consistent in order for the formal structure to work itself out. So think about before you start. Whatever. Take a look at your note lengths of the theme. You balance the cello and viola as well as you possibly can. Uh, measure, complete measure, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Forte, subito piano in the next bar. It's tempting for a lot of people to make a diminuendo. It's nice if it's a forte, if it's a real piano. Uh, another thing that I need to point out to you that is possibly interesting in score study when you get to measure 11, 12, 13, 14, I want you to look at that second clarinet part. Beethoven really didn't have the technical tool to write what we would normally do as a triplet with the first two notes of the triplet slurred over so that the last note would change. In other words, he, he really didn't write Dum, bum, ba, ba, ba. And he didn't want to write the movement in 9 8. But should that clarinet note really be after the last flute note or with the flute note? And then you have to go through the movement and see how many times that occurs. Uh, many of us, myself included now, we, we do change it so it matches. Same problem is going to happen in Schubert quite often. But they just didn't have the technical way of expressing that. Nowadays, we have all these tools, but it's it's something to consider. And it goes all the way through the movement if you choose to do it. If you're gonna do it one time, you have to do it every time. But only when it's that isolated one, not like at the beginning, you can't go da 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 ba da da da. You can't do that lazy. Otherwise he could have written nine eight or nine sixteen. In fact, you have to exaggerate da ba yada yada to exaggerate so you hear the difference between that triplet and the quick note. Here's a good example at measure 32, where the dots are probably misleading. More than likely, this is a marcato stroke on the string. Yeah, ba, 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 ba. To get the fortissimo and the weight, the dot just to me here means separate. It doesn't mean off the string. Look at your sforzandos. Um, keep your tempo flowing. It's a movement that can tend to get slow. Uh, a lot of balance issues to deal with, a lot of phrasing. You look at, for example, measure 99 when the cello and viola of da 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 da
There's no expression mark other than saying dolce. So you have to think about how do you want to shape this and how do you want to show it with your hands? And then come down a little bit and then shape each phrase, do something with it. And don't ignore your pizzicatos underneath that. Once the motor rhythm has started, that's gonna be fine. So make sure your pizzicatos are good, especially that upbeat 16th, give a little accent to it. This gives it a nice flavor. Uh, balance problem, uh, warning, one, eight, uh, what is that, 15? Yeah, 114. Everybody's cranking away at forte and the poor cello and basses have to try to get their low notes. Da, 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 da. So how do we do that? Well, obviously we drop down a little bit, maybe not so forte for everybody, but there's a nifty trick you can do. Non-string players, here it comes. There's no reason everybody has to bow the same way at all the time. What I do is I have one group playing, da, 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 playing every eight notes, changing bow, and the other group, sorry, every six notes and changing bow, and then the other group changes uh, a little bit later. In other words, are not changing at the same time. So you avoid the trap of everything sounding like a bar line, change a bow, and it gives you more notes in fewer bows, giving you a little more uh, uh, heft. You can, if you are so inclined, I wouldn't do it, but since the timpani is going bam, 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 like that, it's possible to consider maybe one stand of each playing separate notes just to give it the punctuation it needs. It depends on your orchestra. Now we get to this from da 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 and he plays on the string at the tip. Um, so I wanna talk about this piumoto, the tempo change that occurs near the end. It's not so easy for people to really pick up what tempo you're gonna do since it's a subito tempo, there's no preparation for it. So no matter what tempo we choose, how do we get that to be together? When you rehearse the movement and you get to this place after you've played it through, go back and say, let's start directly on the Pumoto. Listen to my tempo, two, three. Yum, ba, 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 da, yum. And then when you feel everybody's comfortable on that tempo, stop and say, okay, now please start two bars before the Pumoto. You go back and play it in the tempo you were doing and people remember what that Pumoto tempo is, but you have to do it right away. Otherwise people forget. So always when there's a tempo shift, give people the idea, here's the new tempo, go back one, maybe two measures so they can get into it. Okay, you'll have to decide about the last note, whether it's long or short, there's lots of things to think about. Um, you even have to decide about, is the chord and the violins divisi or not? Or do they go triam, or do they play all four notes? Not as easy as we all thought it was when we started this career, huh? The scherzo, always give a preparatory beat, not just an upbeat, always start one, two. Ba -da 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 -ya. There's no point people having to guess. Guessing is not allowed. I do, see, of course we see people going da 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 da, we see that all the time, but why, why take the chance? One, da, give a small preparatory beat, one, and then the big one, ba -da 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 -da, like that. Then watch this. Da ya da 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 two three one off. Da. Now if you want it right away, dum bum ba. You come off up, and if you want a breath, dum ba bum ba bum bum ba off. Da 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 da. Two ways. Just don't come up if you want a real silence between the beats. Your horns when they have ba 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 ba. That's an upbeat. Pramada, off. Yep, up, up, one, two, three. It's an upbeat all the way through. Uh, so this is all the same. Uh, just have to be really clear, be very precise. Think about the length of the notes when the first and seconds have da da ya, da da da. Is that landing note really short, like a dot? Is it da da ya, 
da da da, or is it da da yom? Da da da, is the tail away with the diminuendo? Every bar, every note needs some thought here. And your tempo is probably dictated by how you think of the trio again. There haven't been that many eighth notes in this opening, but in the trio, bum ba da 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 bum 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 bum, right? So think about that. And you know, down in the lower register, the basses, when they play that alone, it sounds awful. When you go to auditions, you're gonna hear this countless times and you'll really wonder what they were doing in this. Then there's the matter of the second fugue in the ninth symphony where it's a complete mess, but it's fun to watch them. <laughs> it really is. Um, by the way, your phrasing in this trio, it's not what you think. It's two groups of three bars. Dump one, it's a series of three bar phrases. And then it turns into four later on. But you want to always do that that way. That way. Just try to feel it that way. I mean, if you don't, you don't have to. And it's the same when the violins get it, and then you have this big diminuendo that happens. And now you're to recap, which is made a little bit harder um, by the pizzicato prior. Bum, 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 bum. You may not want to take a retard there. You don't have to. But you do have to decide, is the pickup, the recapitulation, going to be a long note or a short note? Bum, 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 or Bum, bum. You have to think about it. And then you have to set up the pizzicato when the cellos play with the bassoon. You have to decide in your first violins at the out tempo, are the grace notes on the beat or before? So many things. And then that horrible grace note that occurs in the pizzicato, uh, about 300, 299. Ba, 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 pia, ba, ba, pia. It's pizzicato. It, it can only go, ba, da, ba, ba. but should it be, da, da, should it be played again? Should the both notes be articulated as a pizzicato? You have to decide. Kind of don't hear it if it's just one, do you? Da, ba, ba, pia, da, da. Especially if they're playing it on the uh, A string. And then that magical moment when everything just stops. Triple piano, we haven't seen that in the symphony before in the strings and the timpani just at pianissimo. Think about that gradation of dynamic. Triple piano versus pianissimo. All of the softest, hard stick for the timpani, maybe even a piece of wood to make it work so you could still hear the pitch. You wanna hear that well. You want the strings playing with non vibrato here for, for a while. You can decide when you want the first violins to commence with the vibrato and everybody else. And then you want those notes in the cello and days yeah, bop, 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 to be together with the timpani and very short as if they were imitating the stroke of the timpani. They're playing different notes. So you want a nice balance between those notes in the timp and in the lower strings. So we said that the last one is slower in the beat than the scherzo, right? So bum, 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 bum. Bum, or whatever tempo you decide, depends on what tempo you take the uh, scherzo in. I get to point out a fun one for you. From the first measure of the finale, one, two, three, uh, four, five, six. The sixth bar. Look at the bassoon part. Is the bassoon playing something different than anybody else is playing? Yes. Da, 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 da. Can you hear the bassoon when they do that? No. <laughs> well, everybody else is playing loud. Is there a way? It's a wonderful line, that little chromatic. Da, 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 da. Yeah, I cheat here. I put it in the violas as well. Playing the 16ths. I could keep a a couple instruments in the violas playing the, the G and the E natural, but I have a few violas playing that bassoon lines in 16th just because I want to hear those notes. I don't want them gone. It's important to me. Think about it. You don't have to do it. Um, how many of you are aware that the, the trombones, it's three different instruments. It is an alto, a 
tenor and a bass trombone. So it's a different color. Back then it probably didn't blend as well as we're used to blending now. Uh, and today we just usually have uh, two trombones and bass. Uh, but back then it was a different color altogether. It's why uh, when you get a work like Scheherazade of Rimsky, a Russian Easter Overture, the solo in the trombone is the second trombone was for the either the, the tenor, it wasn't for the, the high trombone. It's meant to be a different color. Here, there's just a lot of balance issues. Most of your job is to be somewhat straightforward, not to rush, to keep the lyric thing going on. Uh, here's something interesting, another little curiosity. 427 in the horn. I assume we were all in the same place. Horn going, that's the way we always hear it. And yet, it says dolce. Hmm. Hmm. What are we doing about this? Can it be yada-da-da, yada-da-da, yada-da-da? Possibly. Possibly. We've got to respect what he wrote and figure out how can we accomplish that or not. First ending, if you want to convey the feeling of that sonata allegro form, otherwise, for the most part, we don't do it. These days, I've found myself taking this one a bit faster than I used to, and I, I rather enjoy the repeat. It's, it's a kind of nice one, so I sort of do it, but it has to be convincing. Uh, especially the second bar, or the first bar of the first ending with that syncopation. It's a yam, pa, pa, pam, pa, 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 pam, pam, pam. If you really emphasize that, you can get away with it. At the second ending, cello and basses need some help with the brass and the winds coming down in order to be able to hear that. And then the second violins in the fourth bar of the second ending, all this needs to be sorted out. When you study it, look through it, figure out what's going on and what you want to bring out. Um, here's something I, I do. Uh, it's either measure 98 if you have a different version or measure 471, I don't know. Look at the horn part. We get our famous four notes again. Uh, it starts ba, 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 ba. I bring out those last four notes. But the question is, why did the second horn drop down or drop out uh, on the last note? Uh, I guess he wanted the second horn to get to the top note, which he really couldn't do or she on the low notes. Um, I more or less keep it in octaves all the way through. I do a lot of changing in second and fourth horn parts where today we have the valves and we can supplant with some of the octaves that Beethoven couldn't do. It's worth going through and looking, asking yourself in all the brass parts, what if Beethoven had had this instrument, what would he, would he have done? Same thing with flute and high notes. Sometimes there's an extra note or two that we can see Beethoven had to adjust because the flutes couldn't do it. Are we able to do that now? Neville Mariner, the great Neville Mariner, you know what he said? He said, you know, if Bach had had a modern toilet, he would have used it. He said that. If Beethoven had had the instruments we have today, what would he have, what would he have done? Would he have used it? And how would we keep the same character? We cannot go back and listen to music the way it was performed 200 years ago. Otherwise, we'd have to hear it in a concert, arriving by a horse-driven carriage, reading our programs by candlelight and watching the players flip through all the pages, not being able to read anything with the flickering lights. There is a lot to be said for the historical movements that go on, but there's a lot to be said for using and taking advantage of what we had. After all, we listen to those pieces on recordings now that changes our whole perception of how the works go. Um, all right, so when we get to the tempo uh, primo of the scherzo, it's just yam, two, one, two, yam, yam. You can prepare that. One, two, three, wait, and then bam, ba. Give your upbeat in the new tempo so that the first know when the next one's going to take place. After that, everything is much the same until we get to our coda. Da 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 da, ya da da. Very nice. Uh, a difficult moment for conductors is this accelerando that most people do, where we've now discovered it just says, sempre più allegro, it doesn't say accelerando. I wonder if anybody actually doesn't make a, uh, an accelerando. I think we all do it. We assume that's what this is, but maybe not. Maybe it's just letting us know that he wanted you to stay allegro and that the presto coming up is a subito. 
I should try that once just to see what happens. Well, you have to determine for yourself what the presto tempo is. 112 is very fast, especially for all those eighth notes to, to get them clearly. Find a tempo that really makes sense. But getting there. Two, one, two. As you make it a cello round, get your beat smaller. Two, one, two, one, two, one, two, one. Go into one a little sooner than you might have normally thought, but continue there, cello rondo. You'll find that's much more effective. And a cello rondo is about the beat getting smaller, not in your tendency, all of ours, has been to go, no, it's got to slow down. How can it? Nobody can follow anything. And vice versa. When you want to make a retard, expand the beat, make it larger, give people more room so they see they have more to play in. That's really valuable. Don't forget, it's hard. It takes a bit of getting used to. Um, and the last thing to point out, if you can all explain to me what's supposed to happen in the timpani in the last bar, I would be grateful. <laughs> what is that? Is it even notes for the first half of the bar? It can't be, it's in one. And then a trill? <laughs> and should the timpani end with a funk or not? Should it be bomb? Or should the timpani accent the trill, then do the roll and then do a you figure it out. In the last 15, let's look at a little bit of DVC. I put this one on here. So, you, you know, as you see, it's, it's just not easy. And I'm only doing that because I have all this experience with the piece. And even now, every time I do the work, and I'm doing it once this summer, it, it just always requires going back. It's so much easier to deal with new music. You have no preconceptions, it's there. You can figure it out. It's this older stuff that's tough. The reason I picked this is because this is invariably gonna be on conductor auditions, this piece. Everybody wants to see it. So we're, I'm gonna answer some questions for you and give you some, uh, rather than score study outright, it's gonna be more, here are some tips. Is that okay with all of you? Yeah. First thing, do you conduct the flute or not? Mm -mm. Nope, nope. What if you don't like the tempo that the flute does it? You move along in the third, fourth bar. Or you can, as the flute player starts, you look at that person and you pick them up a little bit in the third bar, just give them a little help to move along. Then later on, as we did with this oboe solo, you have a discussion with them about the tempo you'd really like it, or just simply say, do you mind trying out a little faster and or slower? It usually has something to do with the breath they have to take. Most orchestras know enough to not do anything until the fourth bar, but some do need a little help and you can indicate the third bar like that, just a little warning, and then fourth bar, two, three, chord in the oboe and clarinets, and the horns are... Cut off. Now, the next bar is a bar of silence. Do we beat a bar of silence? Some of you are waving no, some of you are not sure. Um, what about people who've never played this piece? What do they need to know? Here's what I would do. Jump a two, three, da, da, five, six, So, and you give it a slightly bigger upbeat than you might have normally, just to show that this is a downbeat, okay? Uh, at number one, I'm gonna assume we all have the same numbers on this one. Sur la touche is kind of like flotando. It's not ponticello. Don't, don't let them do that. It's, it's moving the boat more towards the fingerboard. And you wanna bring out that lovely little cello line where the note changes to A sharp and then the B. It's, it's awfully nice. It's not so important to give big cues to entries like the horn or the flute at four at one and the horn at three after one. You don't have to. You need to give a little look to the third horn in case that person has decided to come in at the wrong bar in measure three. It happens once in a while. I've seen people go into th not, uh, uh, three uh, starting four bars before two. If you're confident that 
people are settled with the rhythm, you can do it. Uh, otherwise, just stay in a gentle line, but don't overbeat it like the person who did the Corelli. Don't just wave nine at us constantly. Don't do that. Just be clear about where your downbeat is and try to convey the phrase, the long line. And then that goes up. You'll have to decide two bars before number two if this is a crescendo through the whole bar or if each little crescendo goes back down to single forte. No matter what you do, I would go back into nine a little bit the bar before two. <clears throat> and be in a light 12 at number two for the harp. By the way, <clears throat> this whole harp part can be done with one harp. They're, all harpists know it. They have a way of doing it. But I would just be one. Don't think of it in 12 as much as subdivided four. One, bum, bum, two, three. Da, ya, da, 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 ya, da, da. Don't conduct the flute phrase. Take care of everybody else. The flute's a soloist here. You stay out of their way. Keep in contact with them, but don't conduct them. Um, before number three, one, two, three, four, five, six. Get everybody's attention before that pizzicato. Ya, da, 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 plunk. Pizzicato is the most important thing in that bar. Balancing the two flutes, five before three, very important. The bar before three, one pa ram two da 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 one. Now this needs a sharper beat for the cellos. One, get a three, one. Da 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 pa da da ya da 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 one da da da. Go into three for the three, four bar, but B in 12 at figure three. Then the three for the next two bars, back to 12 for the fourth bar of number three, go back into 12, then back into three and stay in three right through number four. On animal doesn't necessarily mean faster, but it does mean moving a little bit, animated. Do, sweet and expressif, balances. Um, Balance is really important here. And now we stay in quarter notes for quite a long time. After number five, one, two, three, really look at the English horn and clarinet. He says, très en dehors, really bring it out. He's telling you to do that. And più forte in the violins after that, with the horns being prominent. If you haven't done it, I would probably go into six, either two before number six or one before. Depends on how comfortable you are. If Keep in mind, if you go into a subdivision, you might wind up getting too slow. You want that tempo to, to lead into the uh, tempo primo. Why? Because this is not the landing point at number six. The landing point is the meme mouvement to get to that. That's the culmination of all this. So don't make such a big retard that you get stuck with a really slow tempo over at the uh, D flat section. Uh, pay attention to your woodwinds when they go. Da -dum, da -dum, da -dum, da -dum, da -dum. That's your key. Don't let the strings drag, keep it moving. I would go into six. Um, yeah. Before number eight, one, two, three, four, five, six. Just because you're going to try to relax a little bit, it will have gained move momentum and steam. I would just be in six. And then four at number eight. Here in this piece, your left hand is your greatest friend. It's going to show this atmosphere. Your right hand is going to help people with the beats, but everything, the shaping, the structure, you this, it's not so important, especially if the orchestra happens to know it, which might be the case in an audition circumstance, especially if you're like third or fourth. Players have already played the piece a few times. Uh, so you, you just, you want to shape it. That's what they're going to like. And I don't know how many of you are comfortable with it. It's a good piece to do without a baton. The sound. It, your hands show us how this music sounds. You're a sculptor in this piece. There, there is no reason to have 
anybody seeing that? It makes the beat bigger. I mean, my, my size is the same here. There's no difference. So the stick extends that. So it, it's important to learn to connect both with and without the stick because the stick could go flying at any moment. So you might be forced to do that. Yeah. So nice gentle four um, at figure eight. The un peu plus, plus anime. You, you, can, you can stay in four if you want. Uh, I tend to do it, Nate. And then I go into four in the second bar. Giving a little retard back into four. And then the tricky subdivision is the bar before number 10. You want to be in four, two before ten. Yup, pop, 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 da, 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 yup, pop, 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 then yup, pop, 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 da, 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 da. You can subdivide the second half of the bar either into two groups of triplets or ya, da, 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 da. You have to decide, but you need to do something, and then you get to number ten, definitely in four but very slow. Keep your strings down. You're paying more attention to the strings than you do the flutes. And that antique symbol, sometimes done on glockenspiel. Uh, want that to be Carol. Stay in four, stay in four, stay in four. Two bars before number 11. I've seen a couple conductors do it. I don't like it. And, oh, sorry, it's not there. Uh, you, you can go into 12 here, two before number 11, depending on how far away the cello is from the flute. If they're too far, you need to be in 12. If it's not too far and they can hear each other, you can stay in four and everybody else will follow. But 12 is a little safer to get the tempo with the harp. Okay. Um, 11, nine. Then you go into three, the second of 11 and the third bar, then stay in three. For the last bar before of ya da da then subdivide. Bum, bum, ba. You have the violins and cello play against your beat. Bum, bum, ba. So you're following what the flutes do. And here's the one that I meant to talk about. I've seen some people uh, conduct at number 12 in 12, doing the harps against the beat. Bum, ba, bum, bum, ba. But whoever was in the in the Rossini, uh, in the Rossino, it's the same problem. What you're seeing and what you're hearing are two different things. What we hear is ba 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 ba. We don't see ba ba as a syncopated note, and you don't want to see that. You really don't. <laughs> the conducting has to reflect what it sounds like, and. If the two harps are really good, or if you just have one harp, you can either do it in four, but preferably is in eight. Um, just each one even, each one with the same beat pulse. And then you go into 12 for the second bar of 12 to get the second violins together with the horns. And then you can go back into four if you wish for the final um, uh, uh, three after 12. And then two after 12, one, two, three, one, two, three, four. Stop a little bit, pizzicato, pizzicato. Now see my left hand on that last bar? Why? Because I'm gonna take the flutes and off separately. Some people do plong, two, three, plong, and everybody comes off. It's up to you, but I kind of like the flute to hang over just a little bit like that. So the, just, I know that's a lot of information. I didn't mean to shortchange the Frenchman. And, and I hope you didn't mind that we combine this with a little bit of critique of what you conducted and a little bit of really competition and job preparation. But we got a little bit of a good taste about how we deal with a work that we've heard often, maybe not conducted so much, but how we can look at that. The, the pianist Sherrod Tchaikovsky, we, we were playing, what were we doing? A Rachmaninoff concerto, I think the second. 
and I, I said to him, you know, often you, you probably do this piece quite a lot. What do you think about? And he says, every time is the first time. You need to keep that atmosphere with every piece you do. It's always the first time. You learn from your experience and nothing ever is perfect. Why not? Because practice makes perfect. Nothing is perfect. Ever. It can't be. Because if it's perfect, we have no business to go out there again. It's always improving. There's no end in this search that all of you have to go through. So I want to wish you all the very best. I enjoyed seeing your videos. Don't be discouraged if I said something about, oh, I didn't mean that had to happen. Oh, he was critical. No, I'm just trying to offer you a little piece of advice if you go through this point in your career. And I hope I do get to find out about you and what you're going to be doing. Uh, all the best of luck. Uh, and um, I have to get on a plane and fly to Rhode Island, the first conducting I've done in a very long time. And I don't know if my arms will take it, but it's an easy program, so that helps. Let's get out of the pandemic. Stay safe, stay healthy, keep the masks as long as you need to. Don't let other people tell you what to do. I wanna see all of you on the podium, okay? Thank Bye -bye. you very much, Maestro. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Maestro. Great Thank you. Best. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks much. Uh, Maestro. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, thanks. Thanks a lot. And I'm, I was pleased because I remember Maestro Mata so well. What a tragedy and what a remarkable talent. Uh, listen to his recordings. He was a wonderful, sensible, fine musician. And he should always be remembered by each and every one of you. Good luck. Bye bye. <laughs>